The Coindesk Spotlight is brought to you by Nexo, the place to earn on Bitcoin, Ethereum, and more. Blockchain data firm Chainalysis raising $170 million, doubling their valuation to $8.6 billion. Joining us to discuss this and other on, on chi- on-chain trends is Michael Groniger, co-founder and CEO of Chainalysis. Welcome, Michael. Thank you. So let's start with the elephant in the room. Well, there's kind of a lot of elephants in the room, but the biggest one being UST and the debacle over the past few days. I'd be curious if you've seen any on-chain data, on-chain trends that would shine any light on this incident. So I think there's a lot of things that has been discussed. Uh, One of the things that we always monitor is what is happening on inflows to exchanges. Are we seeing whales leaving? Are we seeing whales liquidating and so on? We haven't seen any trends of that right now. It still seems to be retail driven. I would also say what happens in the traditional markets right now, where you see uh, blue chip shares like Amazon, Coinbase, a lot of others are basically uh, falling uh, with, with the, in, in free fall. That's um, what's happening there is basically that no one is buying. People are selling, not more than usual, but no one is buying. Everyone just stays and waits and wants to see where this ends. And I think the same thing is happening in the crypto space. Retail investors are selling, and uh, and that makes uh, makes the price go down. But if you then look at um, at at, uh, at at Luna and um, and and US, UST and that that problem in in particular, I think Kevin did like a very very good overview earlier today of some of the issues that has been part of the part of part of that that story. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that our team is working intensely to see if we can find anything that. That, uh, that would cast even more light on this. So I just want to zoom in a little bit on what you said. Um, but what, because there have definitely been other reports saying that institutional investors are playing a big role in this kind of current sell off. Um, you know, for example, uh, with the influx of institutional investors in the market, that's when we started to see a higher correlation between crypto and the equities market, right? Because you basically have these institutional investors kind of involved in both. So are you saying that institutional investors are not the pivotal force in um, what's happening in the crypto market and also in, in UST? Because for UST, there's also reports of hedge funds, you know, coming in and like trying to salvage from the wreckage. So I, if you could just tell us a little more about the specific role of institutional investors, both in the crypto crash and in UST, I think that would be really interesting. Yeah, so so on the institutional investor side, uh, I would say the traditional ones, uh, I think some, some uh, big names were mentioned as potential uh, causes for, for what happened with the UST. They haven't even entered the space yet. It's like the the real the real uh, big big hedge funds and so on have haven't gotten into uh, to crypto yet. Some of those who have uh, are clearly looking at the space. And when we look at the blockchain, we look at like big wallets, uh, see how they move, what is happening on that front, and what we see there is not really confirming that that uh, that it's, this is being driven by uh, by rails. So I think that that's that's roughly what we see today. That of course can change. But I also think it's important to remember that what has happened over the last, I would say, two years and so on, is this uh, Robin Hood trend of, uh, of, of financial markets, where a lot of retail investors have kind of gotten uh, more things to say. And we see that they are becoming a bigger force in the financial system. And whatever happens there, whatever trends that happens in, in the other market will definitely cause them to liquidate and mimic what they see in the traditional markets, also in the crypto side. So I think it's more that what we are seeing right now. We saw that you gave us a couple of charts. One was on BTC dominance and another on year-to-date performance of Bitcoin, smart contracts, platforms. Perhaps you can go over you know, what you see in these trends. Yeah, so the, so the trends is that uh, clearly BTC is, is, uh, is still seen, so typically all of crypto, uh, are what I would call uh, risk on assets. So it means that as soon as the market is more uh, risk uh, tolerant and wants more risk, then they move into crypto. Of all the crypto assets, Bitcoin is usually the one that's, uh, that's, that's like signals less risk, so more like a risk off assets in, in, in all of the high risk assets that, that we have here. And we usually see that like people go to Bitcoin if everything else is unstable. And I think what we have seen today, and, and at least like my observations, is that uh, 
typically more people move away from ETH and into Bitcoin that we've seen right now. And right now, I think that, that my conclusion of the market right now is that ETH have actually become an even more uh, behaving as Bitcoin, uh, as seen as uh, less risk, risky assets right now and even in, in the time right now. So the average value from, from, uh, from Bitcoin to ETH is typically somewhere between 12 and 15. Right now it's 14 point something. And I would say that, that what we are seeing on, on that trend is that like it could have gotten down to 15 or 16 or so ETH per Bitcoin, but it hasn't gone that direction. So, so I see that ETH over the time have matured. And it's also, I think what one of the things that's important, I don't look at things in, in the view of short term trends, because I see that the crypto, what we are building in crypto is, is really a long term trend and, and the big picture is important. So something that many might, might find a little bit fringe uh, is something that I, I, I would obsess about. And that's basically what's the stability between Bitcoin and ETH and how is that moving? And that, that I see is like a, a sign of a industry that's maturing. So uh, you, you basically your, your company now is worth eight point six billion dollars, and uh, you, you you raised about one hundred seventy million. Um, what are you going to do with the money? You're not buying Luna, I assume. I mean, what are you doing with the, the money instead? <laughs> no, we're not. We're not buying Luna. Um, what what we're doing with the money? So basically, we are seeing a very high demand from customers for, for products and services based on data. How do you better understand what happens on chain? Uh, many, many things of finance have moved on chain today. Uh, we see DeFi, De DeFi is basically exchanges that moves on chain. So many things happens there. So there's a lot of demand. When we see a lot of demand, we need to build more products. We enjoy building more products for customers. So we're investing in, in building products for sure, but also, uh, Crypto has always been global, and we are trying to expand in in a, a global way. So we are doping down on offices in in throughout Europe, in in uh, in APAC, and also in South America. So clearly, investing in uh, in global growth and ensuring that we can serve customers in on a global scale. So I, I actually, when you say there's more demand from customers, I guess I'd be curious to know, like, what kind of customers? And as you know, you know, one of the controversies surrounding a company like Chainalysis is that, you know, that tension between, okay, Bitcoin is, is, is or cryptocurrency, it's not fully anonymous, but it's supposed to have some degree of privacy, right? And then Chainalysis kind of whole... MO is sort of like breaking down that privacy to a certain degree, right? So I guess the question is, is like, what, what, what are some of the, where's, where's the demand coming from and how do you sort of manage that, that tension? Yeah, so I believe that like the, the core value proposition in crypto is basically financial opportunities. And I think what we have seen over the last many years is, has only proven that to be the case, right? So we've seen a lot of interesting financial instruments verging to the, to the point that we call them experiments, but a lot of that has happened and that has been a core driver from the value generation in crypto. Less so, we have seen uh, privacy coins and, and uh, coins really trying to be 100% anonymous. They haven't driven the value. So the big value generation in crypto have to come from, the, from privacy features. So I, I have to say, I don't believe in the, the thesis that crypto is built for anonymity. It's more like built for financial opportunities. So, uh, so that was, that was uh, answering one part of, of, of the question there. Around our customer base, uh, we clearly have a quite uh, diverse customer base. We have like more than 150 government institutions in 35 countries in the world. And that's more than half of our revenue today. So to say that that, that is growing at a high rate, and it's growing because crypto is maturing. It's growing because it's, it's probably more important today to have access to a analysis license than a police car. It, the world has moved online, and it's pretty clear that, that also governments want to ensure that how do, we, how do we regulate? We can't regulate without data. How do we understand what happened with, with UST? Well, we need access to data. We need to drive all of this by data, and that's a very positive news, I think, because the best thing is informed regulation and having, having the public sector being informed. So that, that is clearly one, one part of our customer base that's growing. 